Okay, hi everyone. Good morning. Thank you for coming here. Um, I'm Kabir, and today I will be presenting on visual navigation for flying robots. And we'll be, um, this is our latest generation system, which uses an embedded GPU for navigation. So um, I'll go through why we need to, and why a GPU is advantageous for this application, as opposed to, say, something like an x86-based system without any GPU. And I'll also go through the basics of visual navigation, um, obstacle avoidance, things like that. So uh, let's start. Now, with the proliferation of consumer drones, and we need better ways to navigate. Now, most consumer drones in the market are highly reliant on GPS-based navigation methods. They use GPS to localize themselves, and they use GPS to hover in position. And as you'll know, GPS is not guaranteed in situations like urban <coughs> canyons. And also, we don't have GPS indoors. So we can't fly indoors without any other external assistance. Um, as you can see, uh, the drones are highly dependent on GPS in assisted modes. And if we do not use GPS assistance, it's really hard for a new pilot to fly one, although it can be made easier if we have extra navigational aids. There are a chance of flyaways due to bad GPS reception. As I said, in urban canyons and places where there is GPS interference, what can happen is you can get a bad GPS signal which tells the drone it's somewhere else when it's not. And then it flies off, and then you've lost your Christmas gift, and then boom, so no. And um, so there is this immediate need for GPS agnostic navigation methods. And especially today, because Christmas is coming, and then there will be a huge boom, and then everyone will be buying drones, and all these drones are reliant on GPS, and lots of things can go wrong. I mean, you just have to see YouTube for crash videos. So, And the obstacle avoidance on consumer drones, there are like only three drones which actually have uh, obstacle avoidance, um, two variants from DJI and one from Unique. And obstacle avoidance on these systems is only marginally effective. Um, they slow your vehicle down so that you can't actually uh, speed into walls and things like that. And they work, of course they work, but they're only marginally effective. So we need better ways to do that. And of course, so our drones are not truly smart if they can't fly, their, fly on their own. And they need to fly on their own everywhere, not just outdoors. Not, they should not have to rely on an external navigation aid just to fly. Uh, this is a short history of the project. Um, I started Project Artemis in 2014 as a small research project to provide indoor navigation solutions. And because drones, flying drones is banned in India, where I'm from, I needed a way to fly indoors, and I needed a way to do it safely. Now, the very first variants of the vehicle, um, I call them Artemis MAVs, micro aerial vehicles. So the very first variant used a simple passive method called optical flow. Um, there was a single downward facing camera which used to track uh, natural features on the ground to stabilize the vehicle. Now optical flow has its own um, limitations. It requires strong features on the ground to track. It is also, there is a limit on the highest speed we can achieve depending on the focal length of the lens and the distance from the ground. So yeah, it's limited. And also, optical flow is a relative positioning method. We, we only have relative velocities of the vehicle. So over time, as we integrate that to position, a drift is going to build up. So over time, if I say if I were flying an optical flow-based vehicle here, it would start drifting and eventually it would end up somewhere else. Although this drift can be mitigated, it's still a limitation. Late 2014, I started research into active positioning methods. The active positioning methods differ from something like optical flow because they actually track landmarks in the environment and we project these landmarks into a global frame and then we, we know that the, these landmarks are here and we localize ourselves against that. So it's not relative anymore, we have a real position here. So we don't drift. Early 2015, um, first flights with monocular visual odometry. Again, a single camera, bottom facing, but now we're using active methods to track our position. 
So that improves that, uh, the drift which we observed with optical flow. But then monocular visual odometry, we are not using any other sensors. We're just tracking pure image motion. We're tracking the movement of features on the ground. And it has limitations too, yay. So what happens is when we're tracking features on the ground, there are several challenges, especially when tracking image motion only. Um, you require sufficient texture on the ground. And then you have illumination changes, featureless carpets, I mean uh, featureless uh, terrain. So and all those things add up to the error. And since this is a monocular approach, we have no way to scale the measurements. So, so what I get is actually an unscaled measurement directly uh, tracking image motion. And then what we do is we scale that measurement using inertial data from the accelerometers, and then we have a metric position estimate. And we can use that to uh, fly the vehicle. We close the feedback loop using that uh, estimate. And since it's a monocular approach, there is no direct way to observe that scale factor which we need to estimate in flight. So basically when we want to fly with a monocular vision system, it requires an extra initialization step. I need to take the drone, wave it around until the scale converges and then it can fly on its own. And that's not really practical because it's not autonomous if you need to wave it over the ground. Late 2015, um, MAV2, that's the second generation prototype, um, we completed that. Flights were successful with monocular odometry only. And uh, we started uh, more work into using two cameras or three cameras to mitigate that initialization problem. Early 2016, MAV3 completed with stereo inertial odometry. So what we did was we switched from one bottom looking camera to two forward facing cameras. Now, having two cameras allows us to triangulate a landmark. And thus, we do not need that extra initialization step. We can triangulate a landmark. We can observe the same landmark from two cameras. We can triangulate it, and we know the exact depth to that feature. And we can use this depth to get the metric position estimate directly. And we're still tracking pure visual features here without any assistance from any other sensors. Now, when I say stereo inertial odometry, what we do here is we track features with the assistance of the inertial measurement unit. Now what happens here is it allows us to predict where a feature can be in the future, and thus we can constrain our search to that area. And then when we know it's in this area, it reduces the computational demand as well. I will go into more detail in the future slides. And now what we're doing is the fifth generation vehicle that's uh, on the table here. Um, it uses a GPU, as I said, and um, it does obstacle avoidance, uh, GPS denied navigation. It does everything the previous generation vehicle could do. And um, it does it much better with lower power consumption. And there are other advantages as well. When it comes to using multi-rotors as a development platform, it's, they are not the best thing you could work with because they're inherently unstable. And they require active control for stable flight. So, so, so there is this notion of a feedback loop which we need to close. Without the feedback loop, which we cannot fly uh, stably. They are limited in terms of the payload they can carry because, of course, the payload limits our flight time. And we can only lift so much. And our, our sensors and computing need to be optimized for a particular use case so that we can maximize our flight times. And as, as this vehicle is using a GPU, we really need to carefully plan what we're gonna run on the GPU and what we're gonna run on the CPU, uh, primarily because GPUs only excel at very specific compute loads. Um, they need parallelizable tasks to excel. If you run an unoptimized version of any standard computer vision algorithm on the GPU, um, it's not gonna perform. You would probably get results an order of magnitude worse than what you'd get on a CPU on unoptimized algorithms. So careful time investment is required there to make sure that we can, make full, uh, we can take full advantage of the GPU here. These are some of our previous vehicles, um, clockwise. That one on top, that's uh, MAV1. 
It used monocular visual odometry and also served as a test bed for optical flow originally. This is MAV2. It used stereo cameras, and that's MAV3, which also used stereo cameras, but with inertial assistance. Now, design goals, when designing this vehicle here, it should be capable of all the features of the previous generation vehicle, GPS denied navigation, obstacle avoidance, things like that. And it should, be, it should be small. This was the primary design goal for this vehicle. It should be small, because we wanted to fly in real world situations where a bigger drone cannot, or where a person cannot. So we're targeting use cases like storm drains and thermal boiler plants, where it can fly autonomously and inspect these areas. It should be capable of real-time high-speed reactive obstacle avoidance. It shouldn't bump into things, and it shouldn't be slow. And it should also be able to transition between an indoor situation and an outdoor situation. Now, this is especially important for real-world use cases, because we could be flying inside a room, and then we could just fly out of a window. You can't do that with consumer drones. The estimator would get confused, and then bad things would happen. And of course, increase the efficiency of algorithms wherever possible by using the GPU. Um, just to put that into context, um, we were doing stereo matching using the two stereo cameras to obtain a depth image. Um, we did this on, all, uh, on the last three vehicles. And the last two used an Intel system. Uh, it was an i7-6700K Skylake series processor. And that's a really powerful processor. And the stereo matching the algorithm would take around uh, the full 200% of the four cores. So that's quite a lot. And then we got results which weren't uh, at frame rate. So that's not very convincing. And what we can do now with the Tegra here is we can run it at frame rate. We can run stereo matching on higher resolution images. And we can do it at around a tenth of the power consumption. Uh, this is the vehicle here. Uh, you can see it. Um, you can see the various components. There is a Jetson Tegra X1 embedded compute platform. Um, it's sitting on a small carrier board, which is the same size as the SOM. You have a Pixhawk autopilot. It's running an RTOS, doing all the flight critical tasks. You have the stereo cameras on, front, on the front here. And you have a GPS receiver on top. That's so that we can transition between indoor and outdoor situations, and also so that the GPS can assist when it can be used properly. And we have some CAN bus ESCs between the frame plates, which provide uh, assistance to the uh, feedback, uh, feedback loop so that the controllers can perform better. Just running through the specs. It uses a Jetson Tegra X1 computer. It sits on a small carrier board from Auvidia. It's a J120 if you want to get one. Uh, it's got a Pixhawk autopilot, um, a Ubiquiti Rocket M5 data link. It's good up to several kilometers. Um, two IDS UI SC cameras, which are synchronized in hardware. I'll come to why hardware synchronization is important here. And we have the Zubax GNSS V2 interface via CAN and the OL20 motor controllers also interface via CAN. And the vehicle in this present configuration can fly for 20 minutes. Coming to the Tegra X1 compute platform, this is just um, the specs of the platform. It's got a really nice um, embedded GPU platform. It's got a quad-core ARM Cortex CPU. It's really small. It's almost the size of my phone here. And you can put it on a carrier, which makes it slightly bigger, but that's, that's sufficient for our case. Um, and as I said, it outperforms the i7 Skylake series processor in terms of perf per watt. I mean, I do not, I'm not comparing raw performance here. I'm just comp comparing performance per watt. And it supports the CUDA API. CUDA is Compute Unified Device Architecture. It, it supports CUDA for really fast uh, algorithm implementation on the GPU. It's, it's an easy way to do it. And there are several other options for GPU programming, like OpenCL for Intel platforms. But among all, all of them which I've used, um, I found CUDA the easiest to work with. Coming to the overview of the navigation problem, when we want to fly indoors or wherever, whenever we want to fly or navigate, there are several problems which must be solved simultaneously. 
So uh, at the very beginning, we have perception, which is observing the environment, localization, getting to know where we are, planning, which is planning our movement so that we don't crash or bad things. And we have control, which is actually getting the vehicle to perform the planned maneuvers. And then we have the operator interface, which is me controlling it, or whoever the operator is, they should have a clean interface to control it via. Yeah, sure. In the previous comparison, when you were uh, comparing the Tegra versus the mm -hmm. Skylake, so was it uh, CUDA on Tegra versus uh, OpenCL on Skylake? Yes. Yes. Okay. Here is our perception. We have forward studio cameras, and the cameras and inertial measurement unit are time synchronized. Now, why time synchronization is important here is we need to have accurate timestamps for the inertial measurements and the camera frames. And when we have a tuple compu uh, composed of this, these three, uh, two camera frames and inertial measurement, we can use that to estimate vehicle motion um, using odometry methods. And this timestamping is critical. Uh, the studio pairs are also used to compute depth images on the GPU. You can see a depth image up there. Um, it's by comparing the disparity between the two images. And these depth maps are used to create a small local map around the vehicle so that we can navigate in that frame. So, so we don't bump into obstacles which are close to us. But it's just a local map around a small radius of the, around the vehicle. And the choice of a sensing suit is highly important for us because we have really limited payload capacity. So on the y-axis, you have the frame rate of the sensor, which is how fast it updates. And on the x-axis, you have the drift speed, or how fast the estimate will diverge if that is the only sensor providing the estimate. Now, on the bottom left, we have GPS. Now, GPS is not fast. The current L1 consumer receivers can only do around uh, 18 hertz or something. And we also have stereo cameras, which are slightly faster, something like 30 to 40 hertz, depending on the interface you're using. And they have a medium uh, drift speed, so you can use that to navigate alone, like we did on the previous generation vehicles. And then you have the inertial measurement unit up there, which drifts very fast. You cannot use it alone for navigation, because Although the inertial measurement unit provides body rates, the accelerations, things like that, we cannot directly integrate that acceleration to position. There are several reasons for this, primarily because our sensors are really cheap. They cost around a dollar or two in quantities. So, and when we integrate the acceleration from that, um, we get really noisy measurements. And another point here is to integrate accelerations, we first need to subtract gravity. And for that, we need to figure out the direction of gravity. Now, figure out, figuring out the direction is definitely possible using the gyroscopes and a sensor fusion method. But even a degree of error in the figuring out of gravity direction would lead to several kilometers of drift in the position estimate in a few seconds. So that's not practical. So what we do is we fuse all these sensors together to get our final position estimate. Now, all of these sensors are used depending on availability and quality. The variance of sensors are individually tracked. And in case a sensor is misbehaving, it is shut down. Now, coming to state estimation, um, the system localizes itself using a combination of GPS and vision, as and when whichever is available and of higher quality. And the inertial measurements are used to propagate the state of the Kalman filter, which we use for sensor fusion. Um, the visual information is taken into uh, account during the filter update step, which is at around 30 hertz, as well as the GPS. That's also taken into account on the update steps, depending on um, the accuracy of the measurements. And then we use the inertial measurements to propagate forward into the future at 200 hertz, which is the IMU rate. And f the fusion of these co uh, complementary data sources allows us to have this really robust position estimate no matter which sensor is available or not in a particular situation. Like indoors, we do not have GPS, but vision is really accurate. And outdoors, where we, we do have GPS, but the natural features which we're observing using the vision system are really far from us. So that degrades accuracy of the vision system. So we want to trust GPS more in that case, as opposed to trusting vision. 
So this is done dynamically as the system flies. And um, you can see a couple of plots there which show the smoothness of the position estimates um, in an <coughs> urban canyon. It's actually flying in a small area with uh, walls around it. And it uses both GPS and vision to fly. Uh, there's a video later, so you can see it there. Coming to the core of the system, the visual inertial odometry method. We have a stereo camera. So we got two image frames. We can observe a particular landmark in the environment. That's the prior. And then we can use a camera model to know exactly where we are with respect to the, uh, respect to the landmark. And we can use that to know our position in the world frame. So, so, so the basics of visual inertial odometry here is we need to estimate the transform from the world frame to the IMU frame. And because the IMU is rigidly attached to the vehicle, if we know where the IMU is, we know where we are. So we use tight IMU camera synchronization. We, use, uh, we track the landmarks directly as, uh, as states in the Kalman filter. So each landmark has several characteristics, like a bearing vector, a depth, and then also the uncertainty about its position. So we track the uncertainty of everything, of all the data sources we know about, including each, each, each feature. So, so we can estimate um, better. The feature parameterization on that is fully robot-centric, which means we track the features in the robot's own frame. And that allows us to do a full power up and go um, system without needing that extra initialization step, which I told you about. So I can just power it on and it would uh, and press takeoff and it would hover here, which we are not going to do because it's not safe. So yeah. How are the features identified? Yeah, we initially use a very basic feature uh, feature tracker called Fast. And then once we have a few features in a particular frame, we choose the features with the best response, which, is, which, are like, which have strong contrast, which are corners, things like that. There are several criteria for choosing good features. And then once we have a feature, we use the inertial measurements to predict into the future. So we try to predict using the, using the inertial measurements where a feature will be in the future. And so we know that it, it, it has to be in that area plus or minus some threshold. So we can restrict our search for new features in that area. That reduces the computational payload, uh, demand. We do not need to search all over the image for a feature which we know it will be, OK, here. I know it's in here. Uh, this is a video of the visual inertial state estimation. Um, no GPS here. It's just using visual features to track. Uh, you can see the two camera views there. The bottom one is showing the tracking. Uh, the, green, uh, the green squares are the feature patches which we're tracking. You can see as, the, as, as certain features come into view and they're also lost. You can see that on the right, um, the colored dots are the tracked features. Here we're just doing some aggressive maneuvers just to show the robustness of the tracking. Um, a, pure, a pure visual algorithm would not have been able to track under these situations. And the inertial assistance allows us to maintain a robust state estimate. Oh, no, they're discovered as we're flying. And what's the particular rate between feature generation and tracking you're using here? Uh, no, no, we, we, we detect features and track it instantly. Yeah, it's, so it's all done in one step. You do both together per frame, basically? Yes, yes. Generation and tracking? Yes, yes. And it's capable of doing this? Yes. With uh, cameras? Yeah, we, we had to accelerate a lot of things to get it to run at uh, frame rate 
on the Tegra because the Tegra is not as powerful as an i7 uh, when it comes to pure CPU loads. So yeah, we had to accelerate the feature tracker and things like that to get it to run in real time. Yeah, the cameras are actually uh, capable of 1280 into 720, but for the visual inertial tracking, we downsample that to uh, VGA and also monochrome because the algorithm just needs monochrome for tracking and that speeds things up. And also VGA for, for the speed factor. Yes? Oh, yes, yes, yes. That's because I was manually flying it. We are not uh, closing the feedback loop here. There is another video which shows um, it controlling its own uh, position. Is it global shutter? Yeah, the cameras are global shutter so that we do not have image tearing when the vehicle is moving fast. So it exposes the entire frame at once. And they're uh, hardware synchronized using a precision pulse from the PixSoc unit. So we know exactly when the image was taken. We also have a corresponding inertial measurement for it. And the, uh, the optics, it's just the consumer optics? Yeah, it's just, uh, well, consumer optics, yes. The lens is just a normal uh, wide angle <laughs> lens. These are very popular in computer vision, uh, the cameras. Um, they're standard computer vision global shutter cameras, which can be synchronized in hardware. I mean, any cameras would work here, as long as they're global shutter. And you can externally synchronize them. And a lens with a greater than 90 to 100 degrees of field of view will be sufficient to run the algorithm. We need a wide field of view because we need to track features. We need to track as many features as possible. And the wider uh, field of view allows us to not lose track during fast motions, especially during rotations. But it's got its own, its own certain limitations of light then. Yes, yes. Light has got to be yeah, yeah, yeah. We need to expose for around. 10 milliseconds indoors in a situation like this. So that limits our maximum frame rate. Yeah. Coming to GPU accelerated stereo, um, this is the core of obstacle avoidance. We directly push down pictures from the CPU. As, as soon as they're acquired, we push them down into the GPU. That's the green bit. We push them down, and they're rectified using a pre-calibrated uh, camera model. <coughs> they're rectified on the GPU. So, so we remove the distortion in the image because they are wide angle lenses. So we remove the distortion. We perform a local matching cost calculation. This algorithm, uh, after, uh, from local matching cost calculation to disparity computation, that's called semi-global matching. So, and that's a standard stereo matching algorithm which can be highly parallelized to be used on a GPU. And it was a really good fit for our case. And you can uh, see more at the link down there. Uh, that's the paper addressing the implementation of the algorithm on the GPU. Um, so you basically just calculate the matching cost in four directions. We merge them, we get a smooth cost. And then at the end, we get this uh, disparity image on the GPU, which we again copy back to the CPU and perform the rest of the obstacle avoidance there. On the detection of obstacles, things like that, we do that on the CPU. So. Um, and this, and the time we have from capturing an image to reacting to obstacles in the environment is only around 30 milliseconds. So the pipeline needs to be really fast because we need to react to obstacles as soon as we see them. There cannot be any lag between detection and avoidance. Uh, what's, the, what's the precision here? The precision? Uh, yeah, for the stereo matching, yes? Yep. Yeah, the precision for stereo matching depends on the depth because it gets worse as you go out further and it's more accurate nearer. Um, it can be mathematically proved and if you have the camera model and the distance between the cameras. So that depends. It depends on the distance from the camera. Uh, closer objects are more accurately detected. Things, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Anyone else? No, thank you. Yeah. In terms of figures, I mean, from five meters, you have you have like one, two centimeters of precision. From yeah, 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 yeah. <coughs> yeah. So we have centimeter level precision at up to from from one meter to around three or four meters, and that changes with the camera baseline, of course. It also changes depending on the nature of the obstacles. If they're highly textured, it's easier to. Uh, detect them, and it's easier for the stereo matching to be performed. 
So it's, it's not deterministic. It depends on a lot of factors, and they keep changing. Yeah, the question more was uh, in terms of safety. I mean, yeah. What's, what's going to be the closest distance that I can stand to this vehicle? <laughs> I'm not going to be bumping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you can clo uh, stand around a meter from it. I mean, the, we've set the distance to a one meter. From like, It'll avoid obstacles up to one meter away from it. Um, it won't get closer to you um, after that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we, we maintain that threshold we, because the stereo matching also fails when you're too close to the camera. We do not want to get too close. So basically, we project a buffer in front of us, and we try to get nothing into that buffer. And if something does enter the buffer, we back off. Yeah, ultrasound. Yeah, yeah. There are several methods for obstacle avoidance. Um, we could have used ultrasound, but it's like only in one direction, and the resolution is really bad. Further, we have the motors directly spinning next to it, and the air currents mess with the ultrasound, so it gets really messy. And the range is really limited. Ultrasound would only work to around, uh, around four meters maximum, and the resolution is really bad. So the and ultrasound has a focused beam, which we cannot uh, change the direction of. So it's not really useful for real-time fast obstacle avoidance. Yes? How do you ensure that the calibration stays accurate over time with temperature changes, yeah. with the rotation of the uh, yeah. rotors? Uh, the cameras need to be quite fixed. Right? Yes, yes. A very good question there. How do we ensure that the calibration stays the same? Well, we don't. We try to estimate changes in the calibration as we are flying. So the system self-calibrates as well in flight. And, and it's very important for the stereo mount to be well designed because we need to maintain that fixed separation between the cameras, the rotation and the translation. So that's something we depend on to do the stereo matching. And you can see here that it's um, designed on a carbon fiber rod. And it's really uh, f uh, fixed pretty well. So we do not want that to change, but small changes are estimated over time um, in flight. We estimate the extrinsics in flight. This is our reactive avoidance system. So traditional approaches to obstacle avoidance usually in involve capturing an image from the camera, computing a depth map from that, pushing that depth map into a global map, and then we perform obstacle avoidance on the global map. Now that's what we did on the Intel system. And while it works well if you have a lot of CPU, it's also slow, so it's not real time, it's not reactive. And we are also limited on resources on the Tegra platform. So what we did here is our algorithm, our new algorithm directly operates in disparity space. So it takes the depth image, it directly detects obstacles in that, and then performs uh, the reactive maneuvers. Uh, we segment obstacles using a method called UV disparity segmentation. You can see the paper there as well. Um, it's a standard method in autonomous driving. Uh, it's, it's an older method, but it still works really well. And it's really fast, which is important for us. And since it acts directly on the disparity image, we can cut out that extra mapping step. We do not need to create that global map. We can just maintain a small local map around the vehicle so that uh, we have the required environmental um, perception. So we don't need a global map. It's much faster. It can react to sudden changes because we are not creating a big map which we need to update and insert into. And thanks, uh, and thanks to this, it can um, avoid dynamic obstacles as is required in real world situations. Yes, yes. Um, as I said, we only maintain a global, uh, a local map, which is around in a five meter radius around the vehicle. So if you've observed that and it's within five meters, we can uh, track, uh, track obstacles behind us. Well, not track them, but we know that there's something behind us. If we have observed it, it is saved. But it's only around five meters around the vehicle. In the global mapping approach, we just maintain an, an entire map. We map whatever we see. And in this case, we just maintain a smaller uh, local map, which we can use for uh, avoidance. Global planning. Now, global planning obviously involves the use of a global map. This is something we are working on currently. Um, it's not 
very easy to run a fully fledged mapping approach on the Tegra. So because of the CPU limitations, obviously. So we need to um, port over stuff to the GPU as far as possible. It's something we're currently working on. Um, the, standard, uh, the standard for global mapping these days in the robotics community and academia in general are octrees, which are a probabilistic uh, free space representation. That's actually an octomap, uh, a map composed of octrees. But, but we can't do that in real time on the Tegra. So, so we need a better approach. Uh, I'm currently working on this. Um, it's a work in progress. It's active research. And um, hopefully we have something out within a few months. And also, once we have a global map, we can directly plan in that map. And that's really useful for things like, OK, I've flown in this room, and now I'm running out of battery, and I need to get back to the original position without bumping into things. And the trajectory needs to be optimal as well, because I want to save battery. It should be the, it should be the trajectory with the least cost. And we cannot do that with the local map, obviously. So we need a global um, environmental representation for that. And as far as the planning step goes, um, on the previous system we used RRT, which is rapidly expanding random trees. It tries to minimize the cost and expands a tree in the direction of our goal. And then we get a more or less optimal path depending on the number of iterations. And RRTs are really great for implementation on the GPU. I mean, they are really, really good for parallelizing. So, and that's what GPUs excel at. So we'll be working on that as well once we have a proper mapping approach up. And we also uh, used to do autonomous exploration on the previous generation vehicle, where you can just tell it to explore, and it would um, find the environment, map out the room on its own. And again, we can't do this yet, because we, we, we can't do a global map yet. So that's something we're working on. Hopefully, we have some good results soon. OK, coming to control, uh, we designed a nonlinear controller for the vehicle, which is not standard. Uh, the standard controllers are proportional integral derivative controllers, which have been in use forever. Uh, it's a standard feedback loop. And um, in contrast, our controllers do the tracking in a model predictive fashion, so it can react to weird things like um, changing weights, failing motors, as far as possible, it is. So yeah, it can uh, react to those. And the way it works is um, the controller receives a high-level path from the Tegra, which is the um, companion computer. And then using, this, using the obstacle information in the local map, it deforms these paths. And, the, and that deformed path is the obstacle-free path. And then the vehicle executes those maneuvers, and then we don't bump into things, and we can um, stay in forward motion. And thus, the system can react to sudden changes without um, deviating from the original goal. It tries to achieve the original goal as far as possible. Even though the trajectory might not be optimal, since the navigator module has um, no planning step involved in it, it will still not bump into things. Finally, the operator interface. Um, it's really simple. Um, I can just use a single tablet to fly that. Um, and it will be safe. I don't need to control it manually, so it's safe. I can just press a button, have it take off. It will op um, avoid obstacles. If I'm manually controlling it, it will also not bump into things, as, as you can see there. Uh, the forward view of the vehicle is visualized as four quadrants. And as obstacles come into view, the quadrants will light up. And if you get too close, the vehicle will break and stop. Or if we are above a certain threshold where we cannot break because it's going too fast, we will um, apply path corrections so that we don't bump into it, we just pass by it. And that, that, that depends on the speed the vehicle is currently moving at. The decision to stop or keep moving in a different direction, that depends on the vehicle's current forward velocity. Coming to our software framework, um, we use a high-level, low-level split here. The critical flight tasks, like actuator control, attitude estimation. Um, these things need to be done at a much higher rate. Around 200 to 400 hertz is the norm. Um, we do that on an RTOS, NUTX, that's running on the embedded controller, the PIXOC. We run the PX4 flight stack on the uh, embedded controller that runs on top of NUTX. And the higher level tasks, like mapping, planning, 
which runs slower than the vehicle dynamics compared to the vehicle dynamics, we do that on the uh, Jetson Tegra X1 companion computer. The Tegra X1 runs ROS, which is the robot operating system, which is again not really an operating system, but a collection of libraries and tools, which is widely used in the robotics community for things like obstacle avoidance and yeah, um, things, stuff like that. It provides a really nice IPC interface for interprocess um, data transfer, and we take advantage of that because we don't want to reinvent the wheel everywhere. And this is our final navigation pipeline, right from image capture to reaction. So the navigation pipeline runs at 30 hertz overall because that's the frame rate of our cameras. We are using these USB 2.0 cameras, which can only run at around 30 hertz when externally triggered. So, and we, we can go much faster. We can go, go around 60 hertz or so, um, given the limitations of the rest of the system. But that would require better cameras. And better cameras are expensive. And we don't have uh, a lot of funding. So We have the GPS receiver, which directly feeds into the um, yellow box here. That is the embedded controller. And on top, that is the Tegra X1. Should have labeled them, sorry. And you have the images feeding into a frame synchronizer. What, what it does here is it takes the inertial measurement and the two image frames and then synchronizes them. So we have a combination of three um, datas, uh, three types of data, which is then used for state estimation. We have the image undistortion step, which removes the distortion, the wide angle distortion from the image. We have the rectification step, which makes straight lines straight. And that is pushed into the Tegra. I mean, it's running on the Tegra anyway. And that is pushed into the rest of the pipeline, which is stereo matching and state estimation. These uh, processes operate in parallel. Um, stereo matching is done completely on the GPU. And state estimation, some parts of it are just accelerated, but not fully. Both of those feed into the local map. And then that is fed to the local planner, which again deforms the paths to get a smooth collision-free trajectory. And that is fed back onto the embedded controller, which is running a trajectory controller. And that controls the vehicle's motors, the actuators, and we can fly. I have a small video um, after this. Uh, this shows you how um, well it hovers in an urban canyon situation where multipath interference makes it really hard to fly otherwise. OK, this is autonomous. Um, I'm not controlling it anymore. So you can see it's stably hovering. It's using vision and GNSS uh, GPS for tracking its position. And this multi-sensor fusion allows us to fly in a situation where it would have been impossible otherwise. You can see over a long term, the GPS, also, the GPS is also used because we are correcting the vision drift here. With pure vision, it would have drifted slightly. But the GPS <coughs> corrections allow it to stay in the same position over a long time. Thank you. Um, that's it. If you have any questions, please. Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was actually trying to fly worse so that I could show the accuracy of the VIO, uh, the visual inertial odometry. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the autopilot flies better than me. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we can actually fly during night, but not using infrared. We have the setup going with um, synchronized computer vision strobes. They're really powerful LEDs, actually. Um, they're synchronized with the camera shutter. So you can fly inside things like boiler plants. That's something we're working on currently. And um, so that's in complete darkness. You're flying inside a boiler. So 
So we can track the features on the walls of the boiler, and um, the strobes keep the lighting up. And it does automatic exposure control um, on the fly. Yes? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because there is some uncertainty in the estimate of each feature position, that uncertainty feeds back into the vehicle's position estimate as well. So, so we cannot always know exactly where a feature is. There is some uncertainty. And that uncertainty slowly builds up. Which means over, say, if I were hovering using vision only for, say, half an hour, I might have, say, five centimeters of drift. Yes. 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 We do know how, how far it is, but then uh, the factor which he mentioned uh, comes into play because when it gets further, the uncertainty increases, and we have to track that uncertainty as well so that it does not ruin our estimate. So that uncertainty adds up in the end. That's why we use the GPS to correct for that because GPS is an absolute position estimate. Although GPS is not very good in all situations, it is a global estimate. I guess you can correct this then later on with better cameras and better optics with the higher MPA. Yes, yes. We can correct it uh, with better optics, better cameras, um, better algorithms, because the feature tracking is not deterministic at all. It depends um, on various um, characteristics of the feature, like contrast, cornerness, things like that. So. So we need to track that uncertainty as well, because there is a lot of uncertainty in the feature characteristics, the bearing vector, things like that. So we use all the features together, and we can get a robust final estimate. Yes? Uh, what happens if a person walks past the field of view? Does it handle that case in any way? Uh, yes, I can actually. I wanted to show that, but I think we are out of time. Yeah, I can show that to you after. Um, I had a demo ready. It won't fly, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes? Could you elaborate on your experience on uh, the GPU versus uh, CPU integration? Did you have any problems like transferring data to back and forth? Yes, yes, yes. Um, the really good thing about the Tegra X1 platform is that we can use shared memory. So it's on the same uh, memory, and then we can share it between the CPU and the GPU. And there are several cases where shared memory performance is actually worse than copying it onto the GPU. It depends on the kind of kernel you're using. It depends on the ordering of data in the memory. But, but in most cases, uh, what we've seen is using the shared memory acceleration eliminates copying completely. And where we do need to copy, we, don't, um, we only need to achieve around 30 hertz. So at that, um, in that time frame, the copy overhead does not really come into play. Yes? Have you considered using uh, another algorithm for uh, sensor fusion, like particle filtering, which is by like, definition going to perform well in, on the, the GPU? Because yes, particle filtering, yes. But um, this is quite a standard approach in academia, uh, the visual inertial odometry here. Because, because we're tracking each feature as a filter state, we are pretty locked into the Kalman filter um, paradigm. Yes, I do. I, I know. Because, yeah. But then we also need to track the uncertainty of each feature. We need to track the uncertainty of the inertial measurements. And that's what a Kalman filter is really made for. And any, in any case, the, um, the filter iterations, they are done on the CPU. And it's not really computationally expensive. So there is no point accelerating the, uh, the filter update on the GPU. Because it works. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Having a large set of particles that would involve simultaneous localization and mapping, SLAM. And SLAM is not something we are interested at this moment because SLAM involves, again, making this global map. And odometry is much faster. In, in real world situations, all you will need is odometry. Yeah, but then you gain the, the mapping. In the yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. We can, of course, um, use a SLAM approach here. But as far as it comes to real world use cases, we can only fly this for 20 minutes maximum. I mean, how big um, a map can we make? 
And I'm targeting use cases like bridge inspection, where we're flying under a metal structure. We don't have good GPS. We do have, however, a really nice wall or a, whatever, a pillar or something, which the vision system can look at and localize itself against. So in that case, um, odometry makes a lot more sense for us. Yeah, the synchronization between the uh, camera and the inertial measurement unit, right? Yeah. So how it works is um, we have a GPIO on the PIXOC, and this GPIO output is connected to the two cameras. They have an opto-isolated input, and uh, the same signal goes to both. So when we want to capture a new image, we trigger acquisition using the GPIO. So we know the image has been exposed at the exact same time. We also know the timestamp of the inertial measurement corresponding to the image capture. And then when the image comes back to us, we can just timestamp the image using the inertial timestamp. So, so all three have the same timestamp. They are against the same clock. And we exploit this for visual inertial odometry. So that means that the, uh, both of the sensors are running in um, manual sync. exposure mode. Yeah, both the sensors are running in manual exposure. Both the sensors are running in sync. And the thing about manual exposure is that um, we, we actually do um, automatic corrections for exposure. There is an algorithm running on the GPU which analyzes the image and performs corrections for exposure. So uh, you can, uh, so 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 we can fly from indoors to outdoors. There will be a sudden jump in the exposure uh, in the exposure, and it'll again um, stabilize. Yeah, but the, uh, the exposure time can shorten. Yeah, yeah, we have. Yeah, yeah, we actually perform the acquisition at a fixed 30 hertz. So there is an upper limit on the exposure. And then we can go lower. It doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. We can go uh, low as 0 0.0009 or something. But that's limited by the camera. And we um, cap the maximum exposure to 30 you hertz, whatever. Sh 30. shutter time, but the actual shutter Yeah. Opening. Yeah. The shutter time, yes. So 30 hertz is a fixed exposure interval with a fixed frame rate. Yeah. It's a fixed frame rate. But then we can go lower than that, as in the shutter time. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, obstacle avoidance on birds flying towards us. OK, yeah, that, that's really interesting. I haven't tried it. But it would probably work given um, enough time. Because birds are moving around, and the system needs some time to react. Enough suicidal birds. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we're out of time. Uh, thank you, everybody. You can meet me for questions after if you want to. And I can also uh, give you a small demo if you want that.